G'day and welcome to Mark and Sam After Work. Today I want to do a video covering a few things, um, one of them being our Remington 700 long range which is in its current form right here and I'll go through those details later on in the video. Um, but the main point of the video is actually to um, help answer a question that I see posted to me and to multiple places all over the place, so social media, Facebook, YouTube, all over the place to, uh, on all sorts of videos. But it's people asking for the overall cartridge length, the length of that round, that custom round and, and all the details that go with it. A um, couple of things I want to go through. I want to go through and show a simple way of how to measure that for people. There's lots of different ways and I'll get to that in a minute. But I'd also like to explain to, to the largest degree, it's not a great question. Um, to the largest degree, people are, now in some cases they're asking a question which is a bit different to that. They're trying to find out the jump or they're trying to find out um, um, the bullet seating depth or they're trying to find out something more technical than that. But a lot of cases um, I think people are under the misconception that because you've got one of those rifles um, and I've got one of those rifles and I want to do up a load and how long should I make my load because it'll all be exactly the same. Um, the misconception is that they're going to be all exactly the same. Um, I saw recently I think it was a Christian Arms um, 300 PRC or 65 PRC or something like that and, and they were just running a new bullet and, the, and the, there was two or three times the question was asked what was the overall length, what was the overall case length, what was the, the length of the cartridge in presuming that because it was the same rifle they had and the same bullet they wanted to use that it was going to be the same length they would be able to use. Even if it was just a starting point they were chasing for, it's fairly flawed that logic. To start off with, because a manufacturer builds the same rifle doesn't mean they used exactly the same ream every time, reamer, um, however you want to say that, to do the chamber in all of them. They might have two or three different ones. How it was set up, how it was centered, how the machining worked, all that sort of stuff changes the exact overall length of the cartridge to end up with getting the same results or to end up getting the same bullet jump side of things. Bullet jump is the amount of distance between where you set up the bullet and where it moves forward to touch the lands, that distance there is the jump. Um, and then the different bullets, different batches of bullets, there's so many differences involved and that's not even getting into setting up seating depth for harmonics in barrels and all those different things. So what I'm really trying to say is that that isn't something you should just go and copy by any circumstances. Um, how to measure it, now there's lots of different, um, and uh, what I'm talking about measuring is the overall case length, so how long you set up that bullet, when you do it in the loading press, when you set it up, how long is your overall length, where, where is that? Um, the way to measure it, there are proper tools, there's a Hornady um, gauge, there's, uh, listen, I presume um, Rock Crusher do a gauge, there's going to be all sorts of different proper gauges and there's proper ways to do this in various forms. You don't need to get too complicated. Uh, there's drilling, you know, threading bullets and making up special cases and stuff to do all this sort of thing. And yes, listen, all very good and can be extremely accurate, done very well and that sort of stuff. But you don't really need to go to that level. If you don't have the time, you don't have the equipment, you don't have, um, it's so easy to do. Time um, is hard for all of us to find in places. There are very simple processes to start this off that work really well if you do it properly. And what am I talking about? The tools I need is a tool that you should all have, I've shown it before, but is a push through that's been chopped off. This is something that I have a couple of different sizes of this. Basically it's got a flat end on it. It is a tool that goes with me with a rifle. It's a tool that is going to be able to get out. It's a, a nice solid shaft. It's going to be able to get out a stuck case that's been jammed in there. It's accessed through a barrel. It's good because if someone else needs it, it's in the truck sort of stuff. But I have a one in a, in a heavier form. This one I think is around about the six and a quarter millimeters big, so it wouldn't go in a 243 or something like that. Uh, but I use it for the bigger stuff. And then I have a, a, a skinny one that goes in down, down to your 17 Hornet sort of stuff. But it's all I'm using this for is it's got a flat end on it so that it can it hasn't got a thread or anything that's going to damage anything and that this is the starting place that we're working with. The next bits I need is I need some vernier calipers to measure it. Obviously you're going to need that in some form or other if you're doing overall length of your bullet. So some vernier callipers to measure it. 
The one sort of special tool is this little bit of quarter inch stainless steel. I've got some tape on it, as you can see here. Now, whether that's a little piece of wood, a little piece of aluminium, a little piece of plastic, doesn't really matter. You'll see what it works like, but that's a little tool for the other side of it. And the last piece I've got, which can happen in any form, is a piece of paper tape. Paper so I can rip it. This is actually a, this is a, a little sticker um, that or you can put on for, for labeling things, uh, for a label maker, but it's just a little piece of paper tape, whether that's masking tape, whatever it is, some, some tape that you can tear with your fingers. It doesn't really need to be, you could use just insulation tape. I prefer paper tape for what I'm doing, but that's it. So how do I do it? I take, well, to start off with, I've also got the bullets I'm going to use. And in this case, the reason I'm doing it is I really do have to find this measurement because it's my 300 wind mag and I want to test it with the 245 grain burger bullets. So that's what I'm about to, about to do. So the first bit of the process that I do is I get my push through in whatever form and then I very carefully put it into the barrel. So be very careful at this end here, very light hands, very light fingers. You've got a crown that you've got to be very delicate with, but I'm very carefully going to feed that down inside. Once it's past the crown, you're really fine, but I feed it down there until I touch the bolt. So the bolt is in and closed, so it's touched the bolt. Put that in there till it touches there. I'll move it closer to the centre so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so I go into there. I get a piece of my paper tape. I just rip off a piece and what I actually do, and I'll see if I can do it in a form where you can see, I actually take that paper tape, whether it's across your muzzle um, with or a muzzle brake, it doesn't really matter, but I line it up to be dead straight with that. So then I can put that on in a form that I know that edge is exactly lining up to where I can see it's not going past it's right level with the end of the muzzle. There's no preload, there's no anything on it. It's stuck to this, so it's moving. And I can, yep. See that, that's got zero um, clearance. It's right to where it's touching the end of the muzzle. That's the first step of what we're doing here. Now I can take this out. I prefer to take it out for the next step. I'll need another piece of tape in a minute, but I simply grab a bullet. Oh, put this forward over here. I'll remove this bolt. Bolt out. Next bit, little tiny bit fiddly. See if I can do it for you all to see. But I simply put it up, took the bullet and drop it. Here we go. Dropped inside there. So get it to where you can see once again actually I'll put it to there so now I take my push through or not my push through my little piece of rod which is set up short enough no not quite short enough I'll have to go underneath there we go so that goes in there so I'm going to push this through into here till I can feel what I think is the back of the bullet now I take this once again very carefully past my crown then I once again carefully go down very light fingers I don't want to smack into that bullet hard or anything but in here coming up shortly there we go I can feel something now I use two my hand on both ends and I carefully move backwards and forwards to where I can feel that, that those lands are just touching. There's no force, it's just sitting there. It's not sticking, it's just to where it's just touching. Now, as you can imagine, I'm sure you've all worked it out by now, but now I simply do that same thing. I grab the piece of tape, line it up exactly so there's no clearance. I tend to double check myself Yep, yeah, make sure I'm exactly that place. Right, out with that piece of tape. Now I can simply measure by eye, take it to where that is neatly even, where it's, where it's just right on the tape and both, so there it is, and there it is, 97.7.
millimeters. Um, or, for those who want to know, um, 3.846 inches. So that is, for this chamber, my, it, my chamber um, overall length. That is, if I build a bullet to that length, then I built it to zero jump. So I built it to where the, the, the bullet is going to be touching the lands. And then I can factor in where I want to take that back. In something like this, I'll probably start at 20 thou. My, my general rule of thumb is there is, no, there is no right place to start. You go with what suits you. I used to start at 10 thou. I now tend to start at 20. I tend to find faster bullets, which are going a lot faster, want a little bit more jump. So I'll be up to 70 thou in the 6.5 and 6 millimeters when they're going fast enough. And I sometimes am, might be back down to where I'm only running 10 thou jump, which is where I used to run this one. But I'll start at 20 and see how it performs. If it groups well, if it's nice and consistent, I'll leave it there. I don't tend to fuss. But really, this story is not about trying to um, tell you what bullet jump you should be using. This story is more about telling you that that's a simple way. That piece of information there tells you what you have. And then you start with where you want to. I wouldn't generally start with that length. I would come back a little bit um, from 20 thou to 40 thou back to start the point. And of course, your magazine, if for, for people who want a magazine feed, then your magazine might be the, the real indicator or the real thing that you're going to be limited to. But there's a way, a very simple thing with a tool that you should all have. Uh, there's a simple way to get it with no extra tools other than what should be in your normal kit. And in truth, in what I'm doing, that's where, that's where I'm starting. The next step I do is I'll load a... a um, I pull it up, I tend to start at that full length and make sure it goes in and see that there's witness. I'll be very careful. You want to make sure that you've measured it properly and that stuff. This is a true um, where the bullet is actually held directly by the lands. When you do it in your case, if everything isn't perfectly centered, you might find you have to come back a little bit. So to start this point, make sure it's all good and it's going to work and then come back, then just push that bullet in a little bit further to work out your load and a little bit, a tiny bit, a little bit more jump, a tiny bit, a little bit more um, of clearance to your lands to start with is generally a decent idea. Um, sneaking up on the lands is something you can do as you settle a load in and you, it it'll starts to raise pressure a little bit, especially with the faster ones. But anyway, listen, that's all I want to show you there. Nice, simple process. Obviously, don't forget, don't go and try and put a cartridge in there now. You've got a bullet in there. So simple piece to go with that, obviously. There we go. Pulled on the floor. And back together. And a bullet. I always inspect, make sure I haven't flattened the tip or anything like that to make sure my reading's true. I get a ball out that looks all perfect as it did before. I know that measurement is good. So I know I have a real place to be able to start that measurement. Let's write it down so I don't forget anything. Okay. So anyway, listen, that's that little story I want to tell you. I suppose now I'll go through what we've actually done here, what we've actually got. As said, this is my 300 Win Mag, uh, which started a long time ago. We've done a few build videos on this one. It started with uh, in, in just a Remington 700 long range with the Bell and Carlson stock. We upgraded stocks, we upgraded bits and pieces for quite a while. Um, and in that standard barrel and action form, it shot out to over two miles and did very well. Not worn out of that stage, I've forgotten we probably were at 2,000 rounds or something like that. It was still working very well. We'd been shooting the 230 grain bullets, projectiles, I should say. And I decided I wanted to just step it up a little bit further and see how it went with a bit more barrel. They were 26 inch barrel. This is now a 28 inch barrel. So this 28 and a half inch barrel, it's a Madco barrel, one and nine twist up a little bit further to suit the 230s, although the, two, the, the 1 in 10 was working fine. But it also let us go a little bit bigger. So we've tried in it and it shot very, very extremely well with the 250s. Um, and actually it showed that the chamber actually works really well with the heavier bullets. Um, and in my summation at this moment, the, the 300 Win Mag actually 
um, probably underperforms with the lighter bullets. The way it's normally sold with your 160s and your 180 grain projectiles, it probably little, is a little bit underperformance for the amount of powder you've got. They're still very good, don't get me wrong. But in those sort of places, the likes of the PRC, the 300 PRC, um, the, the 300 um, short magnum, is going to actually performance wise do better than it because of the long thin powder case in a 300 win mag still decent don't get me wrong uh, the main thing i'm really trying to say or point out with that is it went up into the 230s they it, it performs really really well but actually stood up above the prc and it's going to be above any of the short cases once it went into that really long bullet that takes more to accelerate then the start the, the tall powder stack starts to help it so with all that we started to go up there i had it in various things i think the last time i really shot this thing we were um performed really really well it was in the the mdt lss chassis with one of my barrel guides on the front of it um, with a different muzzle brake but i think that was 2000 meters shot first shot on plate performed really well really happy with it but i was really i suppose the way i design things is not for um, how they perform on the good days. It's really how they perform on the bad days. Um, and this hadn't done anything wrong, don't get me wrong. But I could, the chassis I felt was a little bit light for pushing the heavy stuff like that. Still a very good chassis, but a little bit light for that side of things. Um, and the muzzle brake I had, had wasn't awesome. I, I was trying something, modifying things. So I've gone to my normal four, um, four port muzzle brake. So that's all sorted. And I have the guys at um, at MDT helped us out with this chassis here which is the ACC chassis um, in a slightly different form Th their job is the same as normal beautiful nice strong chassis really rigid really rigid with the mono construction and very heavy forend side of things so I don't say very strong forend but I wanted to go a step further I want to really take this thing and really set the wind mag up to perform as well as it can so I've made another um, custom barrel guard for the front here, which is quite tall, which is in reference to how the, the chassis is quite low on these things. I'll run the forward weights in here. So this is the forward weights and the rear weight. So this has got some real weight to it now. It's like just over 11 kilos. So we're talking nearly 23 pounds, a lot of weight in this little rifle. Um, it's got my bipod system on the front of it. And I actually have, although I've taken the chassis back a little bit, I pulled a couple of inches off the front of the chassis because they are so very long and I wanted to have the bipod there. I still have it fairly long. So that's set up to be super stable, should work really well. Nice strong rear end, nice strong couple up, really strong with extra strength, with a good height in the bipod system. Um, the Madco 29 inch or 28 and a half inch barrel, all really, really good, all in a really nice place. Um, the bit that I have gone to the extra level of, whoops, is up the front here, you'll see I've actually put on an angled um, Picatinny mount. Um, that's to mount on the front of it, this Night Force wedge prism. So this is an MOA outer, which uh, this one is the 100 MOA, which means that it adds from your internal elevation, gives you 100 minutes further. So obviously you flip up your dust covers to be able to use this, I'll just leave them down as it's just a demonstration. Clip that on the front there like that. And then I have 124 minutes I can use in the scope, 100 minutes I use in this. If I've got 150 MOA shot, I can simply clip this on the front, wind this up to 50, I have 150 minutes of elevation. Or I could go all the way to 224 minutes of elevation. Um, that's probably, uh, I suppose, the, the bit that I've, that I've got here, you'll notice this is an angled um, rail up on the front here. I've just taken a Picatinny rail and machined it off on an angle. And that's because this wedge needs to be within, sev within 60 MOA of the same cant as the scope. And you'll notice, if you look, we've got the air attack base here, which means I can actually pop that forward. I can actually tilt this scope on to go to another 70 minutes of elevation. So this little rig by itself, set like this, has 190 minutes of elevation by tilting up the scope. Um, put them together, we've got almost 300 minutes of elevation. As to whether it'll actually work that far, I don't know. I think the wedge is really better designed for not trying to run the two together because we're going to run into where that angle, the amount we're trying to 
give elevation up, which means we're looking the scope down, means we're probably going to look to the muzzle brake at that, at that time. And that's the place where this rail will also be able to work very well with the Charlie Tarak. So I use them largely mounted to the front of the scope, but I just simply put on myself a quick release under here and then the Charlie Tarak will be able to sit on the front here, which has the Charlie Tarak has the extra advantage of the fact that it raises your viewpoint. For those that don't realize, you're looking in down here, you're looking out up there, which means that you get over the top of both barrel mirage, but also muzzle brakes are not getting the road and things like that until you're in excess, coming up into the 400 minutes of elevation before you start to see those sorts of issues. So that's the big fella for the guys who want to go a long way. Uh, but this rifle is capable of all of it. It also has the adjustable base down the back there. So yeah, there's lots of different choices in this combination for us to test all those things um, and do all the different shots in all the different formats, which is showing off what you might be thinking about doing for your rifle but anyway that's them they're probably their competitors in one fashion but actual fact they also are very much different choices for different options that people want to do that sort of thing anyway that's our 300 win mag um, come a fair way from its basic starting point at the um, at the Remington 700 long range which it still performed really well for us but now with this big ACC chassis really nice strong construction our bits and pieces at the front here with the flexibility of, of stuff we've got to be able to use um, with these great products from, from these great manufacturers that have done some really good stuff for our industry. Uh, really looking forward to playing with this one this year. And I should say from what I've seen, the 300 Win Mag has really stepped up, surprised me a little bit as to where it's stepped up and how it's performing. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how it does with the big heavy bullets like this, the 245s. Um, it did very well with the 250s in the A-tip, so I'm expecting great things on that sort of level. And I suppose for the quick nutshell of people that keep asking that sort of stuff, I'm still testing. I'm going to go a little bit further on the 30 cal. I'm going to do the short one. I'm going to do the long, like a... a, a, a um, 3378 Weatherby Magnum, Magnum as even more powder behind it and then come right back down to the Winchester short Magnum as to the short of it. What I'm seeing so far and probably that changeover point was really most obvious in the 300 Win Mag to the 300 PRC is that the 300 Win Mag actually to a degree sort of underperforms a little bit in the lighter bullets that that long skinny case is not really suited to a lighter bullet it still works don't get me wrong and they're still great and they've been used for many many years in that format but where this really started to step up was when we went into that heavy bullet um, there's some logic to go with that but that's what i really found from 230 onwards it stepped up um, in the same place the prc um, it didn't quite step up as much but below that I'm fairly confident, I haven't done the testing of the lighter bullets, but I'm fairly confident that in the lower stuff is where it'll step up. And that probably also means that where the, the Winchester short magnum, the WUSM, um, is going to do really, really well down there with the lighter bullets. So a really great hunting cartridge is my opinion there. Um, and not to say any of these can't be a great hunting cartridge, you know, right up to the rum or even further, the Norma and that side of things. but. It's that the bigger ones really start to, um, the, 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 the long case do a better job with the heavier bullets. The surprising bit, what I'm trying to get to, is how well the Win Mag did. So anyway, this rifle is set up to do as much as it can. Um, it's got some decent weight to it. As I said, I'm running the weights in the front and the weights in the back. We're, in the, we're, we're getting up into the 23 pounds sort of thing. So it's no, um, it's no little fella. It's got some decent weight, which means it should shoot really, really well. Um, yeah, and I just thought we'd show it off. Anyway, guys, um, I hope there's some information for you in there. Keep in mind with your, the, um, the push through said it a few times now, but having one in the cupboard, having one in the, in, the, in the kit, I should say, that travels with you, really sensible idea that gives you the emergency, get a piece of stuck brass out, by far the best way to do things, but also it can be quite a good tool for taking measurements in a very simple form that'll still do the job really well for you. Anyway, guys, oh, I should say on that last note on that one there, listen, I'm not trying to say it's better than any of the proper tools for this. There is obviously all the proper ways to do it, and I'm not trying to say you shouldn't do that. I'm just giving the option for the people who need to ask the question that really they can answer themselves very simply. Anyway, guys, thanks for checking in on us. We'll catch you next time.